First, though, the razzmatazz of show business beckons for Melba. The West End of London, the home of theatre legend. A heady mix of brightly lit success and make-believe. Yet in May 1987, in the unlikely setting of Yeadon Town Hall in West Yorkshire, a little-known amateur company gave the world its first taste of an important new musical. Melba is the work of two men of words and music. David Henniker, who gave a grateful public half a sixpence and Charlie Girl, and his collaborator on the Biograph Girl, Warner Brown. Together, Henniker and Brown have told the story of the closing months of the extraordinary career of an extraordinary woman. A coloratura soprano with a magical voice. Dame Nellie Melba, Queen of Covent Garden, supreme artiste of her generation. A daunting subject. Yet the first staging was given to the Horsforth Grove Methodist Amateur Operatic Society. It came about really when um, the society here were doing a production of The Biograph Girl, which was the first show I did with David Henniker. And I believe Jack Myers, who was the producer of the society, uh, telephoned the agent for various arrangements to do uh, with the show. And we spoke to him on the telephone and thought we might like to come up to see the uh, production. And we were really quite astounded when we came up. It was amazing. Um, in some aspects, better than the West End production. It was a very lively, very vital production. And we were talking with Jack and members of the society afterwards, and we thought, what a good idea for our next show, to get them to showcase it, as it were, our next show. And a lot of time passed, and eventually we came up with this show. And one thing led to another, and now that's just what they're doing. They're doing the first production of Melba. Isn't my voice good enough for you, Melba? I thought so when I heard you sing in Melbourne, the only child in the Albert Street Conservatorium of Music to attain a high F. Melba was obsessed with the notion of being forever remembered, and she planned to achieve immortality through the girl groomed to take her place. That's why I brought you over here, of course, why I've carted you to London. Jack Myers, the producer, watches the six principals he has cast explore the story and characters at a first reading in his lounge. It's three months before opening night. And so you are the chosen one, the one who follows after, the little Melba. The whole production was made by people leading double lives, working during the day and working on Melba most nights. The enormously demanding title role was given to Solicitor's Clerk, Hello. Betty Burr. I'm excited. Uh, I think the book and the music is super. It is a bit daunting as well, the fact that she was a real person. She's not just a character in a play. She was a real person. Um, I just want to do the best I can uh, with what talent I might have. It was still early days when the chorus went into first rehearsals under musical director John Webb. A relaxed prelude to what was to become a gruelling schedule, three hours a night singing for up to five nights a week, and still trying to give their best to their various daytime jobs. Horsforth Grove Operatic Society has more than 60 members with very different backgrounds, but they can all sing or dance or act or help put a show together. The society started in 1967 and uh, we had an old Sunday school that was derelict. We decided that we're going to build a new youth centre and we tried to raise some money for this. And I had this young adult group, 
and we decided we'd put on salad days. We're going to take the St Margaret's Hall in horse with for it. It's going to cost us so much money that I tried to see how much Eden Town Hall would be for it and found that it was a lot, lot cheaper than St Margaret's Hall. So I booked it for two nights and we made £169 profit. OK, so our, our box office income um, then is, is 9500 And then, of course, we've got the expenses to, to go against that. Every show must pay for itself, and the committee were very quickly adding up the costs of Melbourne. They were the largest of any production so far, and the most expensive part of this, the most expensive show, was the set. And then we have the set, which we've agreed at three and a half thousand. Costumes, wigs, properties, nineteen hundred pounds, which is a total expenditure of about eleven thousand. For the Milba set, the Society went to the Lake District base of freelance designer John Parkinson. It is quite an honour to be asked to do the world premiere of a show, and it's also quite a kind of awe-inspiring task, because there's no sort of prior production of it to follow. There's no design for it which already exists. There's no way of directing it which already exists. We have actually borrowed a friend of mine's barn to put up the revolve, which is 20 feet across, simply because if we had the revolve in here as well as the rest of the set, we would never actually be able to build the flats in here. So we borrowed someone else's barn to set that up and see how big it is and make sure it is the size we think it is. Um, and we've laid the plywood on it and cut it and fit it to it so that we now know that we can fit all the plywood around the edges and leave the centre panels to be fitted when the thing is all put together when we get down to Eden Town Hall. That'd make a big jigsaw puzzle, wouldn't it? Now, when we're staying them up, we've got to make a really high contrast between the dark and the light bits, because people in the balcony, who are quite high up, and people who see this part of the set, yeah. won't be aware of the fact it's different colours unless it's a really high contrast. Will it work, Julius, is the question. <laughs> The cost of costuming a big musical would turn any treasurer pale, but more help for the horse for amateurs came from the Jacob Kramer College in Leeds. Fashion students designed some of the costumes, and their tutor, Colin Pogson, personally made one of Melba's spectacular dresses. not often that the students get a chance to show their work to the world. A unique opportunity for them. And for the chorus, the luxury of several costume changes. Now, there's a current to warm and affection. Sincere and true. Four weeks away from opening night and things were shaping up. Moves and sounds coming together under the relentless gaze of Jack Myers. I think I'm enthusiastic. The trouble was, someone said to me, the trouble with Jackie, he's just too enthusiastic, you know. Uh, I take it as a compliment. They weren't meant it as a compliment. Uh, but I think I am enthusiastic. If I'm not enthusiastic, it's no good. If my society aren't enthusiastic, it's no good. Nobody gets anywhere without enthusiasm, do they? A rehearsal is like a performance to me. I expect discipline from everybody. Nobody messes around at rehearsals, no principals. Anybody messes around at rehearsals. You don't get anywhere with lack of discipline. I, I'm, I hope I'm not nasty with the discipline, but through the years, the, the society realises that if they are to succeed, they must instil in themselves discipline. They get onto the stage, and if they are placed in a position, that's the position that they've got to be every night. I won't say if they're an inch out, I know, but if they're two inches out, I know. Words and music for Melba had been arriving from Henneker and Brown a little at a time. 
Now the authors came too, and for the first time saw the cast perform their work. It was an important rehearsal for all concerned, especially Betty. have been the first night. Uh, I think I'd been a bit of a pain at home before I set off then. And uh, it, uh, I just felt I wanted their approval. And so as I sort of do before I go on on the first night, I, I sort of stood there and said, well, all right, you know, let it come and just get on with it. And uh, it was it was exciting, and they were pleased, uh, and and I was delighted that they were pleased. It was lovely. It was a lovely evening. There was less than a month to the opening as the set arrived from the Lake District. It had to be manoeuvred into some rather cramped space. The town hall stage is small and had to be extended by twelve feet. Even a new proscenium arch was built, but still there was no room for the band to sit out front. The hall took on an air of busy construction site chaos. tested and found way, much to the relief of designer John Parkinson and stage manager Peter Boyes. They were trying to fit everything together in the time, and there wasn't much of that left. I think everybody up there is prepared to take a risk and to roll their sleeves up and really get into it. Um, I think the tantrums and the idea of prima donnas always working in the West End is exaggerated, but occasionally you do get that kind of thing where you think, oh, just please get on with it. And from what I've noticed from going up to Leeds, people get on with it, which is uh, it's really the basic thing. You can have all your character motivations and all your method acting and the whole sort of thing, but in the end, as Noel Coward said, say the lines and don't bump into the furniture and the rest will follow. Kathy Carroll, who runs a local dance school, was the show's choreographer. Now, I tend to push them very hard. Uh, I tend to forget that they're, they are amateurs, and I think um, they, they do give a lot, lot back in return. It's amazing what we can get them to do, even though they are amateurs. Uh, we've tried quite a few sort of uh, difficult steps, and they, they cope with it very well, really. For Betty and the principals, the first stage rehearsal was only two weeks before the show opened. And what it cost, we loved and we lived life, high as a star, somehow I knew when it started that our journey to play was a journey. Too far. And 
the set was still only half in place and unfamiliar. But the rehearsal must go on. There were 400 costumes to look after and sort out. A fashion show of the 1920s. Which way are you facing? Where are you standing? Uh, let's think. Have that knot, whichever, to the audience. Yes. So whichever side you're, you're at. That's yes, I can be seen. I have a budget of £1,750, which might sound a lot of money. It, it, you know, I thought, lovely. But when you start breaking it down to eight chorus numbers, um, 40 people in a chorus. On an average, we spend at a higher company perhaps £10 a costume. So for something like Diamonds in the Water or for Stepping Stones, just to costume the, la the ladies would have been £250. So as long as nothing else happens, I have £100 left <laughs> to, um, to use. So hopefully we can manage, we'll just scrape through, with the help of an awful lot of people. And a lot of people have just lent us costumes, which we are very grateful for. With 48 hours to go, the curtain went up on the dress rehearsal. It had a small but intensely interested audience. If there have to be adjustments, please, Lord, let them be minor ones. There never was going to be enough time for the designer. Finishing touches still unfinished. By opening night, Melba was a sellout. More than 500 seats filled for every night of its seven night run. That's three and a half thousand tickets sold. After months of effort, it was now up to the cast. I think it's going to go smashing. I've, I've no worries about it. You know, I think that everybody is well rehearsed, well produced, and I think that the cast probably have got a load of butterflies, but that's a good thing. It keeps them on the toes. But I think that they all feel confident that, you know, we're going to really sock it to them tonight and give the audience a very big, thrilling occasion. Last minute line. I'm going to be in tears. The West End doesn't have a monopoly on first night traditions. Before the opening number of every Horsforth Grove production, there's always been the Jack Myers pep talk. Now, all these people have worked backstage. The lighting, the sound, the costumes, all the people who have been working have worked very hard to give you the spells. Now, it's up to you to get up on that stage and weave the magic. Hello. Yeah, I, 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 I
sushi, Steve. You got stuff in it, eh? You wear makeup and ponty clothes, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Melba's music and lyrics heard and seen for the first time by theatre people up from London. You can see the possibilities of, of, of what could happen. Uh, I must say certain things. I, I think the designer has done a, a, a miracle job which uh, uh, could go into the West End. Straight as it is, it's a beautiful design. I've been truly amazed with what they've done here tonight. And I think it's the most incredible professional performance, wouldn't you agree? Yes, indeed. And I think watching and listening to the voices, being a singer myself, uh, my admiration is unbounded because, I mean, I know that probably they've got jobs during the day. How they do it, I just don't know. I think it's quite magical, and I do hope it goes to the West End. And I think the magic of them actually starting it off here in this incredible hall is, it's a, it's a miracle. It's all there is to it. I think it's very exciting, dramatic stuff. And uh, it, it's, it's really, what is it, it remarkable is that an amateur production can attain such tremendous qualities since apparently January. Mind you, my background is more Handel's Messiah uh, and the chapel in, in South Wales. And I, I, I'm about to say I'm not a Methodist either, but it really is a very exciting production. We're getting good reaction from the audience. They're laughing in the right places. We always think that's a good sign. You can feel them, the tension bouncing back, actually, which is what we want. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. But the applauses are really going on, aren't they? Yeah. You know, you seem to be held in there. We think they're, they're a Saturday night audience. We're, they're always good on the Saturday night. I'm First sorry, we've got to go with you on the voices. <laughs> yes, excuse me, Rob.
doubt swept away, the audience told them that the Horsforth Grove Methodist Amateur Operatic Society had a local smash hit to celebrate. A good enough showcase to tempt the West End or not, they had all earned for themselves a little piece of permanent glory. <laughs> Think that wherever the show is performed after we've done it whether it's done in the west end of london or on broadway or in australia or any other country that on the programs will always be written first performed at the town hall yeadon may 16th 1987 and for my society i think that's a great thing <laughs> is scheduled to open in a pre-London tour in the spring of 1990.